So about the last 10 years, I've been a part of a men's Bible study on Friday mornings, which Eric mentioned, and we get together about 8 o'clock every Friday morning. We were at somebody's house for a number of years, and for the last year, like many of you guys, it, everything's been virtual, been online. And actually, just a couple of weeks ago, we do now hybrid, where some of us are in the room and some of us are online or whatever. And over the years, this has been a terrific group. There's probably 20, 25 guys that are a part of this study on the, quote, roster is what we'd call it. But any given week, maybe seven or eight show up. And as you can imagine, there's many different characters that are a part of this study that will come in and out over the years. And one of my favorites is a guy by the name of Ed. Ed is 65. And the reason why we all love Ed is Ed is a captain. He is a ship's captain. And I'm not talking just like little tiny boats. Ed captains the large trading ships and barges that are on like Lake Michigan or the Gulf of Mexico. And when Ed's with us, he's around for a couple months while he's on shore leave. And then when he's gone, he's on the ship for about three or four months. And what's great is when he comes back, he has the best stories, absolute best stories. And we're always grilling him about, you know, what's happening out there, what's happened on the seas and, you know, this or that that happened. And he tells us about why the ships have to be certain size based upon the, the size of the wave, because if the waves are too big, it'll crush the ship, and all this kind of stuff. We just like to glean information um, from Ed. And he is, you can picture Ed, he is your stereotypical-looking ship's captain, 65-year-old guy, so his hair is a little longer than Elliot's, <laughs> right? And it's silver is also get out, and it's kind of tied back when he has it tied back. When it's not, he looks like Albert Einstein. Um, he's always wearing, like, his khakis, no socks, ship shoes, you know, kind of an untucked denim blue shirt, like exactly what you would think he should be wearing as a ship's captain. Well, anyway, a couple days ago, we are studying through the book of Luke, just like you guys are studying through Matthew, and we're studying a passage where we're all really being challenged about what it means to really believe or trust in God when things are just really hard to do so. And when it gets pretty tough to actually get there, and some of the guys are kind of sharing uh, good, heartfelt stories about what's going on in their life right now or has been in the past. And then all of a sudden, Ed starts, Ed starts to share. And it starts to get real. And Ed shares how his company that, that he's a part of, that he captains for, just got bought by a large conglomerate out of New York City. And at the age of 65, he's probably going to lose his job. And then he starts to go back for us over the last 30 years about, over the last 30 years, how this has now happened to him six different times where something has come in and just you ripped the rug out right from underneath him. Maybe a business partner that left him out to dry, maybe some company, an acquisition, and basically his career has been destroyed about six times in the last 30 years. And as he shares this story, Ed starts to get more and more emotive, as you can imagine. And his words get stronger, and he starts cursing. And he's, and he's online. Some of us are in the room, and some of us are online. And he just starts going off. And you could tell he is mad. And he is angry. And he is just downright angry at God. And he just is letting it out. And our study is one where you can do that. And there's not a problem. Uh, there's no Sunday school answers in our study. But He's just letting, it, letting out his anger to God, and we try to do the normal Christian-y things, and let's pray for Ed right now. He's like, you guys can pray if you want. I'm done praying. I've tried that. It doesn't really work. All right? It hasn't worked for me in the past, and this continues to happen to me. So he is just clearly sharing how angry, how mad he is at God. Have you guys ever been angry at God? It may not be about career. It might be about something with your family. It might be a relationship. It might be a tragic death. It might be an injustice to somebody or a group of people in the world. Often when I get angry at God, it typically has to do with my kids and what I think is unjust to them, right? Or things about myself or whatever. But Think about the times you've been angry with God. Are we, are we even allowed to be angry at God? Like, is that even possible? But if we're all honest, we've been angry at God. And Ed was clearly angry at God. Well, this morning, we're going to study a passage 
and a character in the Bible who gets downright angry at God. And we're going to watch and look at how God deals with that and the lesson that he wants to teach this character. Now, what's fun about this story is, um, and if you want to, you can turn there. I, I'm going to, it's going to take me two or three minutes to get there. As you can imagine, I've got to give you a little background like Ken would do, right? But we're going to study uh, the character of Jonah. And what's nice about this is I asked Ken, and you guys have actually never studied Jonah in, at Village Bible, so at least I won't be doing something that he's done before or something that's fresh in your memory. But I think what you'll find is as we study the character Jonah, he's very human. He's very much like us. Jonah is in the Old Testament, and if you don't know where that is, it's about halfway through. So if you open your Bible, it's about halfway through. I always say in these moments, there is no shame in the table of contents. Go to the front of the Bible, turn to the table of contents, find Jonah, because Jonah's very little, and you might spend the next five minutes flipping pages back and forth trying to find it. Jonah is what is referred to a number of books in the Bible by the, what's called a minor prophet. He is not minor because he's less important than what they call the major prophets. He's a minor prophet just because he has a little book. His book is only four chapters long, whereas some of the major prophets like Jeremiah uh, or Isaiah are 30, 40, 50 chapters long. That's really the only difference. And what's interesting about the book of Jonah and about Jonah in particular is this isn't even a book of prophecy. This is a book about a prophet, but it's a short story or a narrative about one of the minor prophets. So it's a little different than the other minor prophets of the Old Testament because it's not even about prophecy. Now, let me give you a little bit of background of where we are with Israel at the time because that's going to make sense of what Jonah's job is. Moses is taken Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea, parting of the Red Sea, into the wilderness for 40 years. You've heard some of these stories. They're in the wilderness. They cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, and they've been promised by God, and they start to build the nation of Israel. And they're a number of years into building the nation of Israel, and right now, politically speaking, at this point in time, things are going pretty well for Israel. They are starting to gain power and wealth, they're not at war with any of the surrounding nations or armies around them. Things are at peace, and politically speaking, things are pretty good for Israel. Spiritually speaking, things are not very good. Because of how great life is for Israel right now, they've also become a little lax. Their religion is very ritualistic at this point in time, very legalistic, and they have an amazing amount of spiritual pride built up inside them in regards to everybody else outside of Israel. And in particular, they have a lot of spiritual pride built up towards this nation of Assyria. And Assyria is about 500 miles to the northeast of Israel. So Israel, we'll see it a map here in a second. Israel is kind of right here on the Mediterranean Sea, and Assyria is about 500 miles to the northeast. Assyria is the world's superpower at the time. And in Assyria is the capital city, Nineveh. Now, Nineveh, this Nineveh is a little different than our Nineveh. Our Nineveh, you know, just kind of 10 miles down the road on US 31, is very much different than this Nineveh. This Nineveh is New York City, Las Vegas, Hong Kong, all put together in one. The most powerful, the largest, the most pagan, the craziest city of the day. Jonah and the rest of his comrades in Israel would have very much not liked Nineveh. They were the enemy. They were the rivals. They were the pagans. And they couldn't be farther from the truth, right, in his mind. And that's kind of where we start this passage. Now, we're actually not going to study through the whole book of Jonah, so don't worry. There's four chapters. We're only going to do the fourth chapter. So to do the fourth chapter, i got to quickly tell you the first three. Uh, so David, if you could put up the map I have up there. You might not be able to see it too well, but some of you guys have heard some of this story before, hopefully in Sunday school. So God comes to Jonah, his prophet, and says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, this horrible city, and I want you to tell them about me. And Jonah's like, nope, I don't want to go to Nineveh. What I want to do is go the exact opposite direction. I don't want to be tricked in going there. I don't want somebody to take me going in there. So I'm going to get on a boat, 
and I'm going to, with a bunch of sailors I don't know, and I'm going to go across the Mediterranean Sea as far away as I possibly can go to this city called Tarshish, which is in modern-day Spain, as far as the modern, as they knew the world to be at that point in time. Because I want nothing to do with Nineveh. And so he does that. He jumps on a boat with a bunch of sailors and sails off to Tarshish. And we've heard this story, maybe some of you. As he goes out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, God basically sends a huge storm upon Jonah and this boat and the sailors. And it's just nasty storm. It's going crazy. And they think they're going to die. They start throwing weight overboard, anything they can to stay alive. And they just don't know what's going to happen to them. The storm gets worse and worse, and eventually Jonah tells them who he is. And he tells them what he's done, and that he's basically fleeing from God, his God, which would be Yahweh. And this freaks them out, because now they know he's the problem. Why did he get on the ship with us? And eventually Jonah talks them into throwing him overboard so that the rest of them don't die. And so the sailors finally give in, and they throw Jonah overboard. And as soon as they do, the storm calms down, and the boat's okay. But the problem is Jonah's now in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, ready to drown. So then God sends this big, great fish, as it's called. We don't know what kind of fish. Some say it's a whale, but that's just because they don't know what other term to give it. It doesn't really matter what kind of fish it is. Outside the fact that it is big enough to swallow Jonah whole, and at least hold Jonah in the opening of its mouth, or what the Bible calls to as its belly, unharmed. And if you can imagine, God has now got Jonah's attention. With the storm, you're sitting inside of a fish in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, scared to death. Jonah finally starts to come to his senses, calls out to God, repents, starts worshiping God, and does what we all do when we've made that terrible mistake in life. And we're like, God, if you get me out of this situation and just save me here, right, I will do whatever you say. And I will be the most committed person you can ever imagine, whatever. We've all been there at times in our life. And that's what Jonah does in the belly of the fish. And God says, okay, we'll give you another chance. And he has the fish spit Jonah out onto dry land, probably closer to close to dry land. And he spits him out, and then Jonah just washes up shore. And Jonah gets there, and God once again comes to him and says, okay, Jonah, go to Nineveh. And he's he's like, okay, this time I'll go to Nineveh. But I'm not going to be happy about it, but I'll go to Nineveh. Now, if you are a missionary, and you're going to go to the biggest city in the world that day, the most powerful city, the most pagan city, you would probably grab some of your smartest friends and some PR people and some marketing people and some sales folks and figure out how can we put together the best possible communication plan because this is not going to go well. This city is going to want nothing to do with this message that I have to tell them. And I've got to come up with this terrific plan to bring it to them so that I don't get chased out of town or worse yet, thrown in prison or killed once I get there and start saying what I'm supposed to say to them because what he's supposed to tell them is, Nineveh, if you don't repent and change of your ways in 40 days, I, God, this is the word, am going to come in and destroy you, destroy the whole city. That's what Jonah's supposed to tell them. Well, Jonah doesn't come up with this great sales pitch. He doesn't come up with a great strategy. He doesn't worry about all that kind of stuff. He literally just walks into town, starts standing on the street corners, and starts preaching this message that God has for Nineveh. And you might think noble reasons why Jonah probably did that. I don't think they were noble reasons. I don't think he was saying he had faith in what God was going to do and he knew God would change. I think Jonah didn't care. And he actually didn't want this to work. And he didn't want to have a great strategy. And he was going to come with the worst possible message knowing that they were going to kick him out of town. And so he goes and he shares God's message And as crazy as it may seem, it worked. The entire city of Nineveh, all the way to the king themselves, repent, say they're sorry, change their ways, and God relents from destroying them. And you would think at this time in the story, this is when the credits roll, right? This is the happily ever after. It was great, what a cool movie, 
right? This prophet has said, no, get the, you got the storm, you got thrown overboard, you got a big fish. You could think of what Marvel could do with that, right? Um, you spit him out onto dry land. He goes a second time, and it's like this crazy successful ministry that was never supposed to happen in this crazy land and city, and God makes it happen. Great story. Unfortunately, that's actually not the story, and that's not where it ends, because there's a lot more to it, and that's where we're going to pick up in Jonah chapter 4. So if you'll turn with me to Jonah chapter 4, I'm actually going to start in the last verse of chapter 3 to bring us there to chapter 4. And in chapter 3, verse 10, then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Chapter 4, verse 1. But this displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. So what's going on here? This is odd. You just had the most successful ministry ever recorded probably in the scriptures of any prophet. You could have gone home and given the best slideshow to all those churches who are sponsoring you, right? Or the temples or whatever, and told all your prophet buddies, I just went to Nineveh. And Nineveh changed. He could have, he, you would have thought, given his profession, he would have been so excited. But yet, not only was he not excited, he was angry. He was exceedingly angry and ticked off at God. And it begs the question, why? Why is Jonah so mad? He's mad because politically, he does not like Nineveh. They are the rich enemies that get everything Spiritually speaking, they're pagans. They don't deserve God. They don't deserve his grace and mercy and compassion. They deserve justice and punishment for who they are. And more than likely over the last 20, 30, 40 years of life, however old Jonah was, he had a bitterness that had been growing up inside him over the years towards this people group. And he hated them. They were the enemies. They were the rivals. And he even tells God, this was why I got in the boat in the first place. His problem isn't theology. He actually understands God really well. He says, God, I know this about you. You are gracious and merciful. You are slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. You relent from doing harm. He's like, this is the problem. I knew if I went there, you might do this. You might actually be nice to them. You might actually be compassionate. And I did not want that to happen. They don't deserve it. Kind of shows you a little bit of Jonah's heart, right? Can't believe anybody like that. Who are your enemies? Who do you wish ill upon? I know the church Sunday school answer is, I don't have any enemies. We love everybody. But you don't. We're human. And there's people in our lives that over time, bitterness has built up. So Eric told you part of my story. So I grew up here in Greenwood on the south side of Indianapolis. And like all good south side boys, I had to choose when I was in middle school which sports team I was going to choose. You were either an IU fan or a Purdue fan. And the reason why you had to choose, because in the 80s, depending upon which allegiance you chose, the next day in school was either fabulous or terrible. And actually not just the next day, like the next month or the next year until they played again. Because you would get reamed by all of your friends who were Purdue fans if Purdue won or vice versa. And what started to build in me at that age was a huge love for and allegiance towards IU. Yesterday was rough, right? Um, And... Also, a hatred towards Purdue. So like as Eric said, like all good IU fans, I went to Purdue, right? 
But what I didn't do, like some, which I would say are less fans in my mind, um, I didn't change. When I went to Purdue, I actually kept my IU allegiance. I would sit in Mackey Arena. I would wear my candy stripes. I would cheer for Bobby Knight and Calvert Chaney back in the day, and I would cheer against Glenn Robinson, the big dog, and I hated them. And my friends who would go to the games with me hated me for it. They would literally punch me and hit me and whatever they could do after the game if IU won because I was there to take it out on, right? And I hated it. Like, it had grown so deep in me. You know, I thought I would go, and when Purdue was playing other teams, I would cheer for them, just not when they played against IU. It didn't happen that way. Like, literally, if they played against athletes in action or a D3, smallest school you can think of, I wished that they would lose by 50 points. <laughs> and they would lose badly, and I would just hold it underneath. And so after an IU-Purdue game, if Purdue would win, I would get so mad that I would have to go out for a run in the middle of the night on campus and go over to Slater Hill, which is this steep hill where they do some outdoor concerts, and do hill sprints up this hill to get rid of my anger. All right? I got a little bit of an issue. Even yesterday, I had to watch the game in a different room than Kristen, and she even said I still said some things I shouldn't have been, <laughs> right? Um, it's just ingrained, and I wish ill upon that team. We've all been there, and sports is kind of an easy way, and it's a lighter way to do it because it's somewhat removed, but when do we do that with real life, real people every day? Who are the people in life that you wish ill upon or you have? You know, maybe this is another non-real life one, but for those of you who aren't into sports, for those of you guys who are into Marvel the Avengers series, right? I was so mad in that last movie how easy it was on Thanos. Because by the time that movie came along, I hated Thanos so much because of all that he had done to that universe and all the people in the Marvel Universe, I wanted him to pay and pay much worse than he did. He just got to fly, you know, float away and fade away. And I'm like, where's the pain in that? Where's the suffering? Right? Where's the justice if that's all that happens to Thanos? Now, those are funny, but we do the same. What about politics? What about the people on the other side that we don't really like the way they think and believe and their social thoughts and their political thoughts? What about your teacher who has it out for you or your classmate or your ex-wife or husband or your estranged parent, right? What about your boss? What about your employee? What about your neighbor that has really ticked you off or that contractor that hung you out to dry? or whatever it might be. We have people, each and every one of you guys has people in your life that you don't like and you think ill of and kind, you really wish sometimes some ill would come to them. What about just the person who passed you on the way here and cut you off like they weren't supposed to? And you really secretly hope that in about two miles they get pulled over by a cop and you get to watch it because that would make you feel a lot better. That would be justice, right? So, I want you to do something that we're not really good at, is right now in your brain, I've been talking for the last couple minutes, and there's been someone or a group of people that have come to your mind. And if you're honest with yourself, you know those names or faces or whatever it might be, and I want you to think about that and hold on to that name, that group of people, or whatever it might be that you don't really like. They're the enemies. They, don't, they may not deserve God or whatever it might be. They, you don't like them. Just hold on to those names. Let's see what God has to say about Jonah's anger. Back to verse 4. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Basically, God's comeback is, Seriously? Is my doing good to someone else really that bothersome to you? Do you need to spend another couple days in the fish? Because we can do the fish, right? That was pretty easy. Like, what do you not get? How complicated is this, Jonah? And for the time being, this shuts Jonah up. 
So let's move on to verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. And there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. So does this mean Jonah has learned his lesson or whatever? No. Basically, Jonah's going out to pout. He's upset. God just relented from destroying Nineveh, and he's not happy about it. He doesn't want to go back in the fish for a couple days. He's not happy about it. I'm going to go up on the hillside and pout. But you know what? He doesn't just want to pout. There's a reason why he's sitting on the hillside. He wants to watch. Because Jonah knows the people of Nineveh. And he knows this is not going to last. They might have been good for a week or so, or a day, or a couple hours, but they're going to go back to their old ways. And they're going to be who they were, and when they do, God's going to come, and he's going to destroy them. And I want want to watch it. I want to see it happen, because that will really be justice. You know, one of the other enemies that we all have in this room, as Colts fans are the New England Patriots. I mean, let's get serious. For the last 15 years, I have hated the New England Patriots, and in particular, Tom Brady. And if you're anything like me, you have watched way too many Super Bowls where all you do in the Super Bowl is cheer that Tom loses. You don't care who he's playing. It doesn't matter who he's playing. He can be playing your, as long as he loses. He loses badly and looks like a fool when he does it. Right? I mean, this happened to me this last year. I cheered the entire time against him. Right? Um, and this became a little bit evident to me a couple years ago. It was about six or seven years ago. I was having lunch at the B-dubs on County Line right off of 65. And um, there, was an, there was a Colts game on. It was a Sunday afternoon, and Patriots were also playing. So Colts were on most of the TVs, but a couple Patriots TVs. And if you can imagine the aura of the room when that happens is you're cheering over here and then if something bad happens over here for the Patriots, you cheer or whatever. And in the middle of this game, an edge rusher comes around, tackles Tom Brady, and he goes down and he's on the field for a while. And he's worked on whatever and everybody's pretty carefully watching it because we don't like Tom Brady and we don't like the Patriots. And all of a sudden, they cart Tom Boff on a golf cart. You've seen this scene before with other football players. But what happened was amazing. When they carted him off on a golf cart, the entire restaurant cheered of joy because Tom Brady just got taken out for the season. His ACL got torn. And he got taken out. He's gone. And we're excited. Yeah, but we don't wish ill upon people. Right? We don't hope for bad things to happen to other people that we don't like. All right shows even more of Jonah's heart. Let's continue in verse 6. And so the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. And so Jonah was very grateful for the plant. So what happens is Jonah's sitting on the hillside and it's hot and it's sunny and he wants to watch for a couple days what's going on. So God uses miracle number three from nature. Remember, there was the storm and the great fish, and now he's going to grow this plant up overnight that's so large that leaves can cover his head so that basically his bald head, like if you're an adult man, happens, um, doesn't burn, and he doesn't get fatigued in the sun, and he can sit in the shade. And Jonah is happy again just because he's got this plant, and his circumstances have changed, right? Let's read on. But, in verse 7, As morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Well, drama king's back. All right? This is the second time now that he is so mad he wants to die. We've all had kids say that before, right? Um, But anyway, what happened is this plant miraculously grows up and gives him shade, and then God delivers another miracle from nature, and it's a worm, and it's a very hungry worm. 
like the old kid's book, Very Hungry Caterpillar, right? But this very hungry worm eats this plant so quickly that basically it withers and dies, and then he brings in this east wind, miracle number five, to blow away the plant, and so now Jonah's mad again because this plant has been taken away, and now he's going to just die. I'm going to die again on the hillside, right? Isn't it amazing um, how attached we can become to things in life that we had nothing to do with, but when they're taken away, we are traumatized. Jonah had absolutely nothing to do with this plant, right? God grew it. It was there for a day. It went away in a day, but yet when it got taken away, he was traumatized. And because of that, he is now mad at God. Can't believe you took that away, the thing that you just gave to me. How dare you? I'm so mad I want to die. I remember in, well, I was, I was in my 30s, and my whole life um, running had been a big part of my life. Uh, from the time I was, I think, in third grade, I started running, and I did decent as a runner, and I loved running, long distance running, that is. And um, I ran in high school, some in, you know, on the side in college, and then start doing road races and stuff after school. And it became a part of my identity, something I cared deeply about. And then in my mid-30s, about 2003, I went out for a, a morning run one morning, and I came home, and there was like a little tweak in my knee. Didn't think anything much of it at the time. Woke up the next morning, and my knee was huge. Swollen so bad I couldn't, couldn't walk, couldn't do anything. So I remember going to the doctor, and then another doctor, and another doctor, and eventually being told by the surgeon that, Andy, your, your uh, competitive running career is pretty much over. That is, unless you just want to have arthritis by the time you're 40, because your knees are basically shot, and you, this is kind of done. And I remember for about, I don't know, it was about eight, 10 years, I was mad. Deep down inside, I probably wouldn't have shown it a whole lot, sometimes more than others, but I was mad at God. He had taken this away from me. But just like Jonah, he gave it to me to start with, right? Isn't it amazing how mad we can get about things that we didn't even do? He gave me my talents and skills and the ability to do that. He gave it to me as a joy, but I got ticked at him when I thought he took it away from me. And this happens so much in life. And if, you, if we wonder what those things are that are probably out of place, it's the thing that if it got taken from you, you would be traumatized. That's how you know what it is. If it's the thing that you couldn't do anymore, couldn't have anymore, whatever it might be, the item in your life, that's when you know it's gone a little bit too far like Jonah. Now, God has now provided five different miracles from nature to try to get Jonah's attention and teach him a lesson. Someone's trying pretty hard, right? We got the storm, we got the fish, we got the plant, we got the worm, and now we got the east wind, all to say, Jonah, I'm trying to get your attention, I'm trying to teach you something. Do you ever wonder if God does that to you? That he's trying to use all these things in your life right now to get you somewhere, to open your eyes, to teach you a lesson, maybe a lesson about him. And more than likely, it probably happens in the time in our lives when we are most angry or frustrated at him or most confused why life is going the way it is in certain situations. Well, let's see how this conversation finishes up and I'll wrap it up. In verse nine, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on this plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? I know, those are sometimes weird little phrases. We'll get to that. Um, so God, once again, kind of says, 
Who are you? Do you have any right to be angry about this plant? You did nothing. You didn't grow it. It came up in a day. You loved it. It went away in a day, and now you're mad. Do I not, as God, have a right to care about an entire city of Nineveh? An entire group of people that I've loved since they were born, and all I want is them to repent and come back to me? Do I not have that right? And let me tell you a little bit about this city, Jonah, just kind of dig it in a little bit. It's not just 120,000 people. There's 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from the left hand. And that doesn't mean they're stupid. That means they're young. That was a phrase back then that would have meant they're kids that don't, aren't old enough yet to know right from left. So he's saying, do I not have a right to care about this whole city, a city that's big enough that has 120,000 young children and their animals, which is nice for all the animal lovers. God, he's concerned about the animals, the livestock. So that's your dogs and your cats. Do I have not have the right to care about this city and to take them out when you care that much about a plant that you didn't even grow? And what we're getting here is finally to the lesson that he wants to leave Jonah with and us with is his heart for the lost and God's heart for all the lost, not just the ones we like and not just the ones that are like us and not just the ones that are easy to, to love and easy to care about. God chose to send Jonah there for two reasons. One, he cared about Nineveh and those people, and he wanted to have compassion on them. But two, he wanted to teach Jonah a lesson. And I kind of think he might have a lesson for us this morning. You know, three weeks ago, Ken was teaching on Matthew um, as he's going through the book of Matthew, and he taught about the, you know, the two great commandments, love God, love your neighbor, right? And he kind of grilled in about what that meant to look about, about love your neighbor. Then two weeks ago, Andrew came up here, and he went more on that, and he talked to, gave us a better picture of what it looks like to truly love our neighbor, who that neighbor might be, and the needs of our neighbors sometime. And as I was trying to figure out what passage we were going to do here, God laid this passage on my heart and said, not just your neighbors that you like, not, don't just love me and love your neighbors that you like, and not just like the Good Samaritan, those that really need our help, but I want you to love the people you don't like. And that's not easy to do. And I want you to take me to them. And I want you to go to them. Who are the people that God has put in your path that you don't like? That you, are, you have a little bitterness towards? You might wish ill upon them. Remember those names we talked about earlier that God probably brought to your mind? Let's bring those back up now. Um, you know, God didn't tell Jonah, Jonah, this is what we're going to do. I really need you to go to Nineveh, but first, I really need you to care about the Ninevites. So we're going to take a couple months, and you are going to pray, and you are going to fast, and you're going to learn about them, and I'm going to grow in you a heart for the people of Nineveh. He doesn't do that. God doesn't say to us, you can go to somebody once you gain a heart for them. He says to Jonah, and he says to us, I have a heart for them, you go. I don't care what you think about them right now. I'll work on the heart. I have a heart for them, you take me to them. So this is my challenge for you guys as I close up this morning. As you guys go from here, and as you process the morning, and as you talk about, yeah, Andy's bald like his dad is and tries to hold back tears from time to time like Ken does or whatever it might be, and you're going to talk about the worship songs, the ones you liked and didn't like. But as you process the morning and you talk about it, what I want you to do if you're courageous enough with those people you're processing it with, maybe share with them the actual name of the person that came to your mind or the people group that came to your mind that you don't necessarily really like that much. And be willing to share that with the people you're processing with. And then maybe say, what is one thing you can do this week to go to them? To go to that person or to that people group? 
What is one thing you can do? And yes, I'm fine if someone goes, I want to pray for them and I want to pray for my heart. That's fine. Praying's a nice thing. But what can you do this week to go to them, to take God to them, like God said to Jonah? I want you to go to Nineveh on my behalf and I want you to talk to them. And it's not going to be before you like them. You probably still aren't going to like them. And Jonah didn't. But God can still teach us through that that he wants us to have a heart for all the lost, not just the ones we like. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for just this opportunity to come share my heart, but more so for the word that you've given us and the lessons in the word. Thank you for using Jonah to teach us. Help us in this, Lord. As humans, we have people we don't like, but we know that you love them. You want to have compassion on them. You want to extend your grace and mercy, and you want to use us to do it. In your name, amen. Amen. What a great, simple, powerful message this morning. You know, there are several years that I didn't like Andy because him and his brothers were telling me I needed to change my last name to Dalton right after I proposed to Sarah. Thankfully, Eric had my back. He's like, don't do it. They tried to get me too. No, it was a great message. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. Will you stand with us as we close out Psalm 103? The Lord, oh my soul, and all that's within me, praise Him. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all He's done. He forgives all your iniquities, and He heals all your he redeems your life from the dead. He crowns you with mercy. And as far as the east is from the west, so far have you taken our sins from us. And as high as the heavens are over the earth, so great. Have a great week.